So hi everyone and welcome to this video on third degree price discrimination which is the last of our series on price discrimination. And uh, the third degree price discrimination is often called uh, the multi-market price discrimination. And I think if you sort of understand it, you'll get to see that a lot of uh, monopolies uh, tend to use this strategy. So uh, there are different types of consumers uh, and these consumers are charged different prices, but uh, each group of consumers is charged essentially the same price for each unit. And that statement, this first statement right here, is the gist of a multi-market price discrimination. Essentially, the monopolist will segment its market into different groups and it charges the same price for each specific group that the monopolist opts to create. So... What are typical examples of third degree price discrimination? Well, the most common one is a geographical price difference. So quite common. For example, uh, music streaming services such as Apple Music or Spotify, they tend to charge differently uh, with regards to different geographical uh, locations. So for example, the price in the US might be different from the price in a developing nation, say like the Philippines or Thailand or India. So it knows that probably people in the United States would be willing to pay a higher price for that service and people in India or in other countries would be willing to pay a little bit less. So they can opt to do that uh, geographical discrimination there. Also, we see that there are some companies that have special pricing on education. So schools and universities have special prices uh, as compared to private institutions or corporate uh, institutions, which may be able to shell out more money. And of course, the most common one is senior citizen pricing. So more often than not, senior citizens receive discounts in groceries, in essential goods, or in dining in many industries uh, around the country. So they give, us, uh, they give a sort of discount and a lower fee because uh, they, would, they wouldn't have a main primary source of income because they're retired, so they would rely more on their savings and so on. So those are typical examples of third degree price discrimination. And the reason why a firm engages in that is, well, it's, it's simple really. And it's that in most cases, a firm doesn't know the reservation price of each of its consumers. But the thing is, the firm may know which groups of consumers are likely to have higher reservation prices than others. So it means that uh, it kind of infers, okay, or it kind of, it can kind of uh, uh, guess or uh, knowledgeably uh, sort of ascertain which group may have a higher purchasing power or higher reservation price than other groups. And that might vary geographically or in terms of chunks by groups or certain conditions. Uh, but those are uh, scenarios where the monopolist can potentially discriminate. And essentially, the most common method of multi-market price discrimination is to divide potential consumers into two or more groups and set a different price per group. But inside a specific group, all the units sold to those consumers within the group are sold at the same price, at a single price for a specific unit of quantity. So uh, what are the conditions for a monopolist to be able to successfully uh, sort of do the third degree price discrimination? Well, there are two main things, and it's similar to the other price discriminations in that the monopolist has to be able to identify distinguish and separate its consumers into groups and estimate each person's demand functions in that the, the monopolist must discover the different price sensitivities of the different groups. So it knows that this group is probably more elastic uh, to their, their demand is more elastic compared to another group and so on. So it, can, it needs to know these characteristics. Secondly, I think most importantly is the monopolist must prevent resale among groups of consumers. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that the monopolist can prevent buyers purchasing the good at a lower price to resell it to those who are charged at higher prices. So for example, uh, for example, a geographical difference, people in India could potentially buy the good and resell it to people in the US for a profit because the price disparity is quite high. So it needs to sort of uh, prevent those scenarios from uh, happening. And um, those are the two main conditions that we have. So 
As in other forms of price discrimination, the multi-market price uh, difference is not a consequence of the different uh, cost of production. So what does that mean? Uh, if we have different groups in an economy, to the monopolist, they discriminate on price on the different groups. But in terms of cost, it's not necessarily costly. Uh, the, the cost of producing that same good or item doesn't change uh, if you're in one group or another. So the, the marginal cost of producing the good remains the same, whether you're producing that good for a group that has a higher... Uh, that has a higher willingness to pay compared to another group. So we'll explore sort of that thing as we go on. Okay, so I think to be able to get it, so let's try to do a simple calculus analysis of it. So let's assume that the monopolist can perform third degree price discrimination and it can perform it um, when there are only two groups. So let's assume for simplicity that there are two groups. So the firm's total output is Q, which is Q1 plus Q2. Okay, so that's uh, because we have a quantity that's sold for group one. Okay, so that's for group one and a quantity that's sold for group two. So Q1 is what's sold to uh, group one and Q2 is what's sold to group two. And again, we suppose that the demand functions of the two groups are known to the monopolist. So the monopolist knows the behavior of one group from another. So that is... Uh, the inverse demand function of group 1 is some function of Q1. And of course, um, the inverse demand function of group 2 is some function of Q2. Such that uh, the demand curve, of course, should still follow the property that it is uh, downward sloping. Because again, it still follows the law of demand. So... Given this in mind, we can actually form the total revenue function of the monopolist. So that's equal to R, wherein R is just equal to the revenue it collects from group 1 plus the revenue it collects from group 2. So that's going to be equal to revenue 1, that's just P1, times Q1. And then revenue 2, that's just P2, times Q2. Okay, And we know that prices are determined in the demand function, so that's P1 as a function of Q1 times Q1 plus P2, which is some function of Q2, times Q2. So we get R, the total revenue of the monopolist, which is just equal to R1, which is some function of the amount of good one uh, of uh, quantity we sell into group one, plus R2, okay, which is the amount uh, which is dependent on the amount that the monopolist sells to group two. Okay, so that's the total revenue function. And from this function here, okay, we can derive the marginal revenue function. So we have two in this case, so that's MR1. Okay, so that's, if we take the derivative of the total revenue function with respect to Q1, we get, um, that's essentially the derivative of R1, Q1, uh, dQ1, which is just equal to your marginal revenue uh, one. So in this case, you have two marginal revenue functions because, again, you have two groups. So you have one for group one and you have one for group two. So you derive that with respect to Q2, which is the amount that Q uh, that group two gets. So that's the R2, Q2, the Q2, which is equal to MR2, Q2. Okay. Now, the firm's total cost of producing the good okay, is a function of total output. So which means that C is some function of Q. Note that Q is uh, Q1 plus Q2, which means that C is some function of Q1 plus Q2. Okay, and to uh, a monopolist, okay, the firm's mono uh, MC or marginal cost of producing an extra unit of the good, so that's MC, is just the derivative of your cost function with respect to Q. And... Uh, you'll know that that's just MC Q, okay, which is, uh, could be rewritten as Q1 plus Q2, right? And what we'll notice is that you can prove it with the same derivative. You can show that the firm's MC or marginal cost is the same, whether it's produced for group one or group two. So the, the cost of the firm it is the same, whether it produces the good for group one or for group two 
what changes is potentially the revenue it gets from group one or group two, depending on the elasticity of their specific demands uh, with respect to the price that's charged by the monopolist. So that's why they can discriminate between the two groups. But the cost of the firm is the same. So regardless of whether you're in group one or group two, the, uh, the firm's cost to produce that additional unit for you is the same. Right? So the marginal cost of producing an extra output is the same whether it's produced for group one or group two. Okay, so again, like in any uh, monopolist, the, the main goal of the firm is to be able to maximize profit. And in this case, it chooses a level of Q1 and Q2 that will maximize profit. So the objective function is we want to maximize, uh, the monopolist wants to maximize profit with respect to Q1 and Q2. So profit is some function of Q1 and Q2, which is equal to revenue 1, Q1, plus revenue 2, okay, Q2, minus uh, the, the cost, which is some function of total output, which is Q1 plus Q2. And we find that the FOCs for a maximum are essentially you derive the profit function with respect to the quantity for each group. Right? And you equate that to zero to find the extremum. Okay, so Q2 equal to zero. And we'll find is if we take the SOC, we're going to be able to derive a Hessian matrix because this is with respect to two goods. So the Hessian matrix will be equal to uh, the second order derivative of, with, of profit with respect to uh, Q1 twice. Then you have uh, these two, Q1 Q2, then you have this one, Q2, Q1, and you have this one, okay, with respect to Q2 twice. So that's your Hessian matrix. Now, by Young's theorem, these two things there are equal, right? And if you want to uh, derive the SOC, of course, for a maximum profit, it requires that H1, so that's the determinant, so that's this one there. So that's partial squared profit Q1 squared is less than zero and okay, H2, okay, which is essentially the determinant of that whole Hessian matrix. So the determinant of the whole Hessian matrix uh, is going to be, so if you can derive this on your own. So this is just going to be that. So AD minus BC uh, times this one. squared minus bc but you know that these two are the same so that's just uh squared pi q1 q2 they're the same by young's theorem so just squared and that should be greater than zero right so those are the conditions for the soc and what we'll find is if we solve for the focs we're gonna get something that looks like this so if we derive profit with respect to q1 so we have a Q1 here in R1, so that's uh, dr1 Q1 over dq1, okay? But we also have a Q1 here in the cost, right? So that's minus the partial of your cost function plus Q2 with respect to Q1, okay? And you're going to get, uh, this will reduce to, okay, uh, uh, dr1 Q1 dq1 minus uh, d c q over d q right because there it would be the same marginal cost for every firm and we equate that to zero and we're gonna be left with d r1 q1 over d q1 equal to d c q over d q right and you'll know that this is gonna be equal to marginal revenue one as a function of Q1 is equal to marginal cost as a function of Q. And if we do that same derivative, but for Q2, we're going to be left with the same condition. So that's going to be dr 2 q 2 over dq2 uh, minus, uh, minus dcq dq. Therefore, uh, for Q2, so this is for Q1, for Q2, it's just going to be MR2 Q2 equal to MCQ. 
So we have that. And I think it's pretty straightforward that you can deduce that we achieve the same uh, maximization condition, which is that marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. It's just that the marginal revenue varies depending on the group that you're charging or the group that you're analyzing. And we equate it to the same marginal cost because again, the, co the marginal cost to produce a product for good one or good two, it's the same to the monopolist. So assuming that the SOC is satisfied, then solving for the two uh, FOCs, which are these ones, okay, so we end up getting that, uh, would yield us the profit maximizing quantity sales for the two groups. And overall, okay, we can determine that the profit maximize, so profit maximization, maximization, okay, it requires, okay, it requires, requires that, okay, so that's MR1, Q1, is equal to MR2, Q2, is equal to MC, Q1, plus Q2, okay? So that is the overall uh, profit maximization condition under a third degree price discrimination. And it just means that the MR of the last unit sold to both groups has to be equal to the marginal cost of the last unit of output produced by each firm. Okay, and it means that at the maximum profit, the marginal revenue that you get from the two groups are essentially equal. So it means that you exhausted uh, all the potential revenue that uh, you can get from that. So um, that's a brief introduction of third degree price discrimination. In the next video, we're going to explain more on uh, the potential welfare consequences of third degree price discrimination as well as graph uh, a scenario of third degree price discrimination and eventually in the video after that we're going to do a specific calculus example on third degree price discrimination so thank you for your attention and i'll see you in the next video